Thank you, everybody, for joining our session, Catalyzing Modest Stewardship in Supply Chains. My name is Jens Hönhoff, Vice President of Sustainability and Corporate Governance at DEG, the German Development Bank for the Private Sector, which is a branch of the KW Group. And I'm very honored to be your facilitator for that today's session. Greetings to you all, for all of you who are connected from Europe, Africa, the Americas, and possibly also from Asia and Australia. I know the time difference is very difficult at this time. I hope that those one had the chance to see the session on Monday. Otherwise, this session will be recorded and made available to the participants afterwards. The topic uh, under discussion today is catalyzing water stewardship in value chains. Value chain, this is a global network of actors that are involved or impacted by the decision to produce, distribute and sell an item such as a product or produce a mineral or commodity. I think all of us have, have been coming across this kind of things because every product we will buy will have been uh, come through a value chain initially. Value chains uh, you know, come in different shapes and forms, some company, all of their cooperations all around the world. So they produce them directly or they will work with a small network of external suppliers. Some companies are a mix of owned operation and independent franchise all around the world who in turn operate with a range of external suppliers. There are also a huge of range of companies that are not involved in any form of production themselves, but instead work with a vast network of wholly independent suppliers who serve various tiers of production. So it's a relative complex situation we find there and relative to water topic we are talking about today and other natural resources. What is come to all value chains is that there is a procurement decision and a natural resource impact. So any company decides to make or sell a product uh, or produce similar makes an impact on natural resources. That decision triggers an impact wherever place the sourcing occurs. So in understanding water related impacts, we need to understand the supply chain of production and the value chain nature of the relationships from where the decision was made through to where the impact of water use happens. Value chains uh, are different from supply chains, though that is uh, are not just about buyers and suppliers. Personally, I work for the DEG, the German Development Bank for the private sector, through providing investment finance to producer companies and emerging com com economies. We are also part of the value chain that connects, for example, the production of fresh fruits, vegetables in Latin America for their consumption in the US or in Europe. Other types of investors and financiers form part of the value chain of most global companies. So it's basically all of us who are involved either as consumers, producers, traders, or even financial sector. Value chains can also be considered to include actors not involved in the production, but who can be critically impacted by the production. Uh, this is the public sector, of course, the community, civil society, municipalities, governments. So water is a cross-cutting uh, element uh, which is needed from everybody basically. And value chains are so important because they involve these different actors with different scales of influence and agency. So if we want to address the issue of water sustainability, it follows that it's helpful to connect the full value chain to a common understanding of production decision-making and water-related impact. At DEG, we are fully aware of, this, of it now, if we change the slide, just to give you some quick insight, how we work with the Alliance for Water Stewardship with producers and supply chains. So we are aware of the financial water-related risks and impacts. And uh, we know that the impacts cannot be mitigated only by the producing company within their 
premises by reducing the water footprint or taking precautionary measures within their company limits. But they really need to have a sustainability engagement with the basin, with the, all the stakeholders I mentioned before in the basin, communities, public sector, et cetera. And that's what we want to promote in Latin America, joint efforts. Also because we have a large portfolio of investments in the agricultural sector in Latin America. And we know that customers, uh, especially in Europe, want to have more sustainable products and that retailers, uh, like there are largest retailer in Germany, Etika, is uh, requiring from their producers sustainability proof for the water topic for their purchase of their products. In this framework, we also want to have uh, the more alignment of these kind of standards uh, with other agricultural standards so that it would fit in uh, in the common approach and that it will not stand out as a singular effort from the company, which would be difficult to meet, but it would be a part of the overall sustainability effort of the company. I would now like to go to the session and uh, if you could show the panel of the where we start in our discussion, I will welcome in our panel, uh, Sarah Wade, which is the, Sarah is the sector lead of the Alliance for Water Stewardship and leads the strategic programs of AWF. AWS, Sarah will open up with a short presentation about water stewardship and the AWS standard system. This will be followed up with a facilitated panel discussion together with Sarah is uh, Carlo Gai, the technical manager of water resource at Nestle. Carlo is also head of sustainability for Nestle Waters, has been involved with water sustainability programs for over 10 years. We also have Lisa Hook, uh, which is senior manager at GAP Inc, uh, the global sustainability team, where she focuses on water strategy and leads the USAID, GAP Inc, and Women Water Alliance as chief of party. Lisa has experience developing programs and partnerships that advance water, stewardship, climate adaptation, and environmental governance. And we have uh, Dr. Drew Reynolds, Technical Director of Total Produce. Drew has enjoyed a career of spending over 30 years in the fresh produce industry and has traveled globally, supporting growers improve and meet the standards and requirements of branded customers. He's built a reputation in product development, new technology, food safety, quality, and sustainability. He has experienced a wide range of horticultural and food manufacturing operations. He's currently Group Sustainability Officer for Total Produce, recently renamed Dole PLC. Just a technical uh, observation, we will Reserve at the, uh, at the end of this discussion time to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, please put your questions in the Pathable platform and feel free to put these questions as the discussion goes along. We will pick them up and uh, pick out the questions at the end of the discussion. So the uh, we will have the, for the next 40 minutes, discussion on the panel, and then we will have 15 minutes discussion time for the uh, questions you will answer. I will now hand over to Sarah, who will give us an introduction on the Alliance for Water Stewardship. Sarah, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you, Jens, and uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, great to see uh, lots of you joining us today. Um, AWS members, uh, friends from the past, and those of you who are perhaps newer to the AWS system as well. Welcome all of you. As Jens said, I am the sector lead at AWS, and I'm going to kick off the discussion today by just giving you a, a short overview of water stewardship um, and the Alliance for Water Stewardship, just for those of you who maybe don't know us quite so well. And then I'll try and go quiet so that we can hear more from our panel. And um, to start us off, what is water stewardship? Well, I'm sure many of you already know the answer to this question. 
Um, but you can see the AWS or the Alliance for Water Stewardship definition on your screen now with some particularly important elements highlighted in green. So we define water stewardship as the use of water that is socially and culturally equitable, environmentally sustainable, and economically beneficial, achieved through a stakeholder inclusive process that involves both site and catchment based action. Now, why am I starting with a definition and what's different about this? Perhaps you might be wondering why water management isn't sufficient. Well, many of you will know, I'm sure that site based actions such as efficiency measures are simply not going to be enough to overcome the scale of the water crisis that we face. One aspect of this is that water is simply too cheap in many parts of the world. So cost related impacts of water risks alone are not enough to stimulate the kind of actions that are required to solve the problems that we face. The other important factor is that water related issues vary depending on the local context. So a one size fits all approach is simply not going to address the risks that businesses are likely to face and other types of water users as well are likely to face. So consider this, what use is it to make your farm or your factory super efficient if the next water user downstream just uses up that water instead by expanding their own production to take advantage of perhaps more water being available thanks to your efforts? How can one farm or factory build resilience in the face of a changing climate if everyone else using water in their catchment or watershed carries on as normal, making no changes themselves? That's really where water stewardship comes in. It involves taking all of the actions required on your own site, but then going beyond that, beyond your own boundaries, to work with others in the catchment or watershed that you rely on to identify and address shared water challenges. For global brands and retailers, this means working not just in owned operations where you perhaps have direct control, um, but also looking into supply chains to identify whether you're exposed to water risks there instead. And if you are working with suppliers and other stakeholders in those places facing high water risks through stewardship to reduce those risks. So that's water stewardship. Um, let me tell you a tiny bit about AWS. AWS or the Alliance for Water Stewardship is two things. We are a global membership collaboration and we are a sustainability standard for robust, credible water stewardship. Our members come from business, civil society, and the public sector. And since membership was introduced in 2016, it's grown globally to over 150 organizations now. Our members unite behind a shared definition of water stewardship, as I just shared with you, and a common approach to doing water stewardship at a site and catchment level. And that is the International Water Stewardship Standard or the AWS standard. You can see the standard on the right of your screen. It was first launched in 2014 and has evolved since then through our first review and revision process. The standard has five steps and five outcomes, and the outcomes are shown on the far right of your screen. And the standard itself can be used by any water user anywhere in the world because it is responsive to the local context. Anyone is welcome to download the standard and the accompanying general guidance for free from a4ws.org. I'll note that AWS also provides other resources to help you on your water stewardship journey, including things like training, case studies, webinars, and other types of knowledge products. And you can find all of that on our website, but we will also share some links at the end of the session. So that's really all from me, um, because the main purpose of the session today is for you to hear from the different organizations that are working within the AWS system. But I'll leave you with this message. A responsible water steward should aspire to achieve a net positive impact on the catchment. They should use the resource as sustainably as possible, and they must look beyond an organization's boundary to consider its interaction in the catchment as a whole and the related impact on others. I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists. So with that, Jens, back over to you. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And I would ask uh, the panelists to, to put their video on in order to have a lively presentation. Um, maybe, Brenda, we can uh, take off the, the slide so we can, all the participants can see the panelists. And if you can, if you want, you can also, as visitors, move to a different view of this so you will have all the panelists at the same time. So, 
my first question would be going to all of you, Carlo, Lisa, Drew, uh, which didn't have the opportunity to present themselves yet. Each of you are working for a different organization, a company in different sectors. Uh, could each of you describe for the audience what your business does and especially what is your nature of the company and value while it's related to the topic of today, value chain, and where are you in your water stewardship journey? Carlo, would you want to take the first step in this? Yes, thanks a lot. And, and thanks for having me here today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you are. Um, well, uh, I am here uh, representing Nestle. So Nestle, I think most of you know what we do. We are a leading nutrition health and wellness company. We have a history of more than 150 years. Uh, I don't want to lose you with so many uh, figures, but uh, we have thousands of brands. We have hundreds of countries, hundreds of factories. Uh, so overall, we operate globally. Uh, also, we are aware that water is a, uh, an element, a vital element that is cutting across our entire value chain because uh, uh, not only uh, we are aware of the risks and opportunities in managing uh, water issues uh, wherever we operate, but we are also aware that the same risks and opportunities are uh, lying there for uh, the locations where our employees are living because they are part of communities. Uh, our um, suppliers, especially agricultural raw material suppliers are located and, and, and those who buy our products. So this is very important for us. And this is the reason for why water is one of the three key elements in our creating share value framework. Now, when uh, I uh, have to quickly answer where do I am or where do we stand in our water stewardship journey, uh, well, it's always very risky to self-judge where we are, but I would rate ourselves quite advanced, I would say, because we have been one of the private sector leading companies uh, moving in the direction of, uh, you know, uh, shying away from only looking at water management, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned, so more the introvert part of water management, but going into a catchment focus and, and, and understanding that the only way to uh, uh, target, uh, address, and probably solve the resilience problem is to work together on key stakeholders using the same water resources within safe watershed, rather than focusing too much into internal water management in our factories, because yes, this can decrease dependency on water use, but it may not, and most of the time, does not solve the real uh, catchment water issue. I will stop here for the moment. Thank you very much, Carlo. I will hand over to Lisa to give your point of view in this discussion, probably to give a background on your company and also your journey to the water stewardship. Yes, happy to. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I work at Gap Inc, which is a global apparel retailer and the parent company to the brands Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic, and Athleta. And overall, the apparel industry as a whole relies on water to make clothes. So without water, we can't make clothes. Um, in fact, we estimate that 6,000 liters of water is used over the entire lifetime of just one pair of jeans. This includes water that's used to grow cotton, wash and dye textiles, and even in consumer care and laundering. Uh, and how we make this product is really by partnering closely with suppliers, um, but we, we don't own or have direct control over their operations to manufacture product. And in fact, the further up the supply chain we go, uh, the less visibility and and uh, influence we have, including where cotton is sourced from, how it's grown, um, and that raw material impact. At the same time, cotton has the largest water footprint within the life cycle of uh, a pair of jeans or a t-shirt. Um, uh, and many of the places where cotton is sourced from, but also where textiles are manufactured, face extreme water stress, places like India, Pakistan, uh, et cetera. And 
So just for some context in terms of our value chain, so much of our uh, engagement on water is through influence and incentives uh, with our business partners. The other aspect of water that we look at is really recognizing that our business relies not only on these raw material uh, and production inputs, but also the people and communities who help us make our product, including cotton farmers and garment workers. And they have a share, they also share these water resources where product is made. So a key element of our water stewardship strategy is really focused on um, that holistic view, understanding our impacts um, from a business perspective, but also the broader uh, system where people and communities um, uh, and where we are in that journey is we really focused first and foremost uh, a water risk and efficiency perspective, reducing our own uh, water use in manufacturing, moving towards a stewardship-based approach where we're partnering with cotton growing and textile manufacturing communities um, through a partnership called the Women in Water Alliance with uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. And now looking to really, as a next step, connect even further our water strategy with our business strategy. Uh, and so, you know, I think just to hone in on, it's, it's always an evolution um, and always looking to make improvements. And I'm looking forward to this conversation about uh, the role that AWS um, can play in supporting the, the, the private sector on, on their water stewardship journeys. Thank you, Lisa. That was a great introduction to your company. Looking forward to the further discussion on this. Pass now to, to Drew. Drew, could you briefly describe uh, your company's activities and relationship to the water stewardship journey in supply chains? No problem at all. Uh, thank you, Jens. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, well, we have a lot of things that are similar to what Lisa's explained to you. But Total Produce is essentially a fresh produce trading and marketing organization. And within that organization, we do have a number of direct production operations, particularly specifically to the Dole company, where they're growing bananas and they're growing pineapples. But in the main, similar to uh, Lisa's operation, we work with third party indirect growers where we don't have control. And we work with them to supply the fresh produce requirements of branded retailers, uh, food service companies, and wholesalers. So, of course, the retailers, they push for requirements. We're doing their brand, so we have to follow in behind that and make sure it's being done. And when you, it's an indirect situation, it doesn't make it the easiest thing in the world. So our value chain to serve those customers is very diverse and yes it is price affected it's price associated and that's a big driver to what growers and people can do uh, so we have many suppliers the big suppliers right down to individual growers and small family growers that may be part of a cooperative or a producer organization and then we've got larger growers that have more resource uh, but all of them uh, have a lot of work to do along that journey it's probably interesting to say that we're not a manufacturer, we're a distributor. So our sites are very low water users. Our sites are also, uh, luckily, not in high risk, scarce water areas. So as a result, as a business, we're generally pretty low risk from a water perspective. But we do recognize that most of our water risk, most of our footprint sits with the product we sell. Fruit and vegetables is 90, 95% water. We are exporting, importing an awful lot of water around the world. So we believe we need to take a responsibility in this area and take a lead. And that's one of the main reasons why we're very, very involved with AWS. So as one would expect with such a wide and global supply base, the journey is not simple and often it's complicated. The on-ground situation differs depending on the market, the customer, uh, the community. And that's becoming more and more important with the likes of fresh produce and production. And of course, there's legislative demands and one country might ask for something and another won't. But I believe we might talk about that later. 
In the gold doll group, we do have direct managed farms that have already achieved the standard. We've actually got 13 farms in Ecuador and Colombia. Uh, and they will tell you themselves, it's not an easy thing to do, but they've achieved a lot and they feel they've moved forward a great deal and have a very good framework to work with. So to be brutally honest, our journey is from the very start where we're still working with indirect growers who only just started. To be fair, most growers, and I've, as I said, uh, Jens said earlier, I've worked in the industry 30 years. Most growers are really, really good at looking at their own situation, seeing how important water is for their business, how vital it is, and within their own boundary, they're very, very good. However, outside of that boundary, there is so much more to do. So we've got points where we're collaborating, countries where we're collaborating. We've even got a couple of model farms we've now set up in Spain uh, and Tenerife to actually show growers this is the way to do it. And that's the starting point. So we've got everybody from the start to the finish. Uh, and we're even going to start with, we've got a couple of production sites uh, that don't use a lot of water in respect to a lot of other companies, but we will be trying to do it at that level as well. So that's, that's us. Thank you, Drew. That's a very great insight. And I think a co very common point, Sarah, between uh, the companies is uh, apart from the differences in products they have and the differences in structures they're having and also in, in history, how they're working and uh, how where they're based and how they operate, is the common challenge how to manage the supply chain. And can you tell us how AWS can support these companies uh, to manage better the supply chains in water sustainability topics? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Jens. Um, it's a good question, and it's great to get such diverse perspectives to really frame this conversation. I think the the thing I would say, you know, obviously there's a starting point. AWS is a site-based standard. Um, so many companies go through the process that, that Nestle, Total Produce and Gap have all gone through, um, which is to first of all map and risk assess your operations and your supply chain so that you can understand where you've got locations of high water risk. So the obvious answer is where the standard comes in um, is once you know where you've got sites, whether they're sites you own or suppliers sites facing high water risk, you can then use the standard as a way of um, hopefully mitigating those risks. But where AWS um, really is, is strongest, I think within that is through the stakeholder engagement piece, because as everyone on our panel has already mentioned, water is a highly contextual issue. So what water risk looks like in one banana farm could be different for another banana farm. Um, but the thing I've heard a lot is that the communities uh, that surround the farm or the factory uh, are the places where your employees come from and where your, your customers come from as well. And as you'll have seen in the definition of AWS, stakeholder engagement is an absolutely fundamental tenant of what we do. Um, and that's really where the standard and AWS as an organization can help these companies to reduce their water risks. It's by really working in partnership, a word we've heard a lot already, to identify those shared water challenges, um, work out who you should be working with, whether that's at a site and a catchment level or at a, a regional or even a global scale to address those challenges and then getting on and doing it. Um, and I think the thing I would say that I'm sure our panel will attest to is that this is not a once and done effort. Um, it's an ongoing learning journey that everyone goes through. I don't think anyone's quite crack the code yet um, on water stewardship. There's nobody that can claim to have done it and finished. Um, so it really is an iterative process of continual improvement and learning. And that's the other side of where AWS comes in um, is as a multi-stakeholder organization, the other half of what we do is really in helping share that learning con to continually enhance water stewardship practice around the world. Um, I'll stop there because I'm keen to hear from the others on the panel and let you keep asking questions, Jens, but good points, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this gets me to a very good point. Uh, as a development finance institution, we always look for risk management and also to see business opportunities, because in the end, sustainability is always very strongly linked to this monetary sustainability of the business. And Lisa, probably you can start off. 
uh, the benefits of AWS. I understood it's not only about risk management where you look for the benefits. You also look for the business opportunities across your value chain. Probably you can describe that a little bit better. Yeah, so I, I'll take this in two parts and first talk about just the opportunities I see around AWS in general and then what that could mean and look like uh, in terms of engaging manufacturing um, suppliers. So in terms of the opportunities around AWS uh, as a whole, you know, the framework is really the only verified certification on water stewardship, which offers a really uh, just helpful indicator in terms of that assurance of saying this is a, a, a a recognized process that suppliers are going through um, in terms of their water stewardship journey um, and, and really can offer a shared approach for consistency across various um, sites. The other thing that AWS does is um, it connects dots uh, in, a, in a unique way. It connects dots um, between inside the fence operations and water use, but also puts that in context of that broader uh, water basin. The other area where it connects dots is uh, really looking at not only the, if you will, uh, nature side of water, the volumetric aspects, water quality, even water quantity, but also the people side of, of water uh, related to drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, those two elements coming together is pretty powerful um, from my perspective, where again, we're looking at both the the nature elements and the people elements of water, um, recognizing the shared use uh, uh, between those two kind of very broad stakeholders. And then the second uh, part of my answer to your question is around the opportunity for engaging manufacturing suppliers with AWS is that it really, with that certification or at least the process of the framework um, that AWS offers, is it communicates expectations to suppliers on that continuous journey uh, opportunity to improve around water stewardship. It could even incentivize suppliers uh, not only to address the impacts within the walls of their fence, but also start to, to open the aperture and engage uh, their local stakeholders and understand those water basin dynamics, um, something that may not have happened otherwise. And uh, the third piece that I think is um, an opportunity is with that aperture expan expansion and those that incentive to talk with other stakeholders, even catalyze other partnerships um, with uh, stakeholders who have shared interests in these um, in these uh, addressing shared shared water challenges. So, I think. Um, uh, again, it's that process of the journey and AWS really offers that, that kind of clear, consistent framework and certification stamp as a strong indicator for here's the intention and direction of where a supplier is looking to go. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, that is really great insight on, on the opportunity side, which goes far beyond the factory walls, basically. Carlo, probably with you having, with your company having production sites all over the world virtually, um, what is the main benefit you can see in the uh, applying the AWS standards at your company, but also on the supply chain? Well, in fact, uh, well, I like very much what you said, Sarah, before uh, speaking about uh, the stakeholder piece. I think. Uh, what is clear for us that uh, uh, what is stewardship and AWS as a leading platform is about linking the technical elements in managing water with the societal elements uh, in dealing with water. So you cannot um, uh, keep them apart. It's just a mixed way of approaching water uh, uh, within the catchment. So, um, I think the approach is very similar and, and, and the key reasons for why AWS for us is, is key is very similar both for the operations, our factors where we have um, evolved in our journey with uh, the commitment to certify uh, all the bottled water factories. And we have also certification ongoing uh, for food factories around the world. And on the other side, maybe the agricultural supply chain, um, which is very massive, is probably the biggest part of our water print where we do not necessarily 
own operations, but we are also adopting the principles of uh, the standard. So uh, there is a common approach, maybe a more accurate uh, 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 approach when we do uh, certification through to the standards, but uh, AWS overall um, um, is unique because of the standard. And the standard, uh, maybe I can give you a, a, a a perspective more from a reputational standpoint, uh, especially on the Baltimore side, we are very often uh, into local uh, uh, dispute with certain uh, campaigners. I think we are doing great when it's managing water resources, but we have realized that uh, we need to do more than uh, self-declaring our good practices. And uh, the reason why we have engaged since the very beginning to uh, create this universal language, which is the standards, because many years ago, people that were talking about water stewardship different ways. And so it was even impossible to agree on a common set of criteria. So that was the first point. Then the beauty is when you start implementing it because you realize that even in places where you thought you were doing very well, both technically and societally, there is a, a, a big learning and a big opportunity to improve, especially on the stakeholder engagement. And uh, when you certify, I think this is uh, where I start with, you have the chance to have a certification speaking for you with a very uh, thorough process made by a conformity assessment body coming into your place, auditing your practices, and uh, you get the certification only if you pass through this lens. Um, but I think that the beauty, uh, and I always uh, insist on the fact that AWS is different from other platform or the, or the stewardship platform is because we have the standard. But the standard gives anyone, anywhere, any moment, the chance to start implementing water stewardship, just taking the standard and implementing into your locations or with your suppliers. This is a beauty, this is a uniqueness that we have with the AWS and we should insist with that because this is really making the differentiation point. Thank you, Carlo. That's a great insight in this. Um, Drew, from your experience, uh, you have se also several companies in your proper supply chain uh, being certified already and also companies being in, not owned by yourself uh, on the way to get certified. Do you already, what is already your impression of benefits you get out of the AWS process? How would you describe that? Uh, I think it's fair to say that, uh, like many fresh produce organizations, we had to think very carefully about joining AWS, primarily because any standard has to add true value to the people in the chain and the growers. Now, if you go to many growers, these small ones particularly, the audit burden to achieve a retail standard or to achieve global gap even, the industry standard, is significant. And then when you put other standards on top of that, uh, a customer standard, for instance, that again makes it difficult. So we didn't want to create our own standard or do something. We wanted to work with someone who'd already got the standard that is recognized globally, the one standard that really does water stewardship well. And we saw that. We also like AWS and we see those benefits because it is that global standard. It is a very clear framework and a formal approach on how to do water stewardship. Of course, for us, it was a whole new meaning to go outside of our boundaries. And that still is a topic of major discussion with the guys who haven't joined the journey. But it was the point where we felt, well, we, you've got to stretch yourself. If we're going to do sustainability properly, whether that be water or emissions, you've got to stretch yourself. So we did see it as an opportunity, possibly like Nestle and one or two others like Edeka, that we could take a lead and actually start to direct people. And we're doing that in particular locations because some of our customers haven't joined the journey, but we fully believe in that journey. And as I said, as an organization, we don't use a lot of water. It's in our value chain. So there was a real key point there for us. 
other than that, one of the things that really did says we don't want to see a proliferation of more standards. And when I started talking to AWS, they were already talking to Global Gap and benchmarking that standard. And you brought it up in your very first introduction, Jens. I think it was vital that work because what I do see with growers and growers along that journey, very often what we find is they start to improve standards over a, a long period of time. And then you go to them and say, well, if you do that bit and that bit, you've actually got the standard, you've achieved it. They often do it without even realizing or noticing. And that's where I mean, that's the journey. Not many of them are going to be like the farms that we've got in Dole where, right, we're going to do it. We're going to find a way. Uh, not very often they need to go, right, a little bit, little bit, little bit. Oh, we've actually achieved it. So you do Global Gap first, then you do Global Gap Spring as an example, and then you do the AWS standard. So we saw it as a path. We, and everything in sustainability is a path or a journey. Then I'm going to blow the, blow the trumpet a little bit for AWS because what I really do think is important is you have to train people. You have to talk to people. You have to be able to communicate. And within the organization, there's some excellent communicators. And I've been involved in a few of the networks. And it really is good to collaborate with other people who are on the same journey, who've got the same problems, and you can share the journey with them. So that, that would be from us. There's a whole load of benefits but just the training and the communication and the networking has been a really great help for us. Thank you, Du. And that gives us a good insight of also the challenges of the agricultural sector and, and all the standard requirements from, from the buyers and the, the traders in between, et cetera. That brings me a point um, to the requirements. Uh, DG as a development finance institution, we also, as a development finance institution, have our requirements on sustainability in all of our customers and clients. Uh, we want to provide finance. We will ask them, we will give them a thorough look at the sustainability topics, including the water, as I was mentioning also in the beginning, not only at their own productions, but also in their supply chains. Probably a question to, to any of you. How often uh, do commercial banks, investors, or, or shareholders ask you about your water sustainability strategy. Uh, is, is that already a topic which came up to the CEO level, uh, which leads the way forward to the future, like climate uh, and, and zero net emissions do it nowadays? Well, if you want, I could take that one straight away, make a bit of a discussion of it. Uh, we, like many businesses, uh, disclose our sustainability information and very proud to do it to the CDP. Uh, like all businesses and within the CDP questionnaires, you have to uh, consider a wide range of stakeholders. And of course, your investors and your banks are, are, are key uh, to that process. But we perceive that uh, disclosing our sustainability work, our uh, really open book situation. This is what our sites are like. This is our supply base. And these are the problems that we've got trying to develop this. Uh, the CDP is a nice platform to do that. So for us, uh, it's an easy question because yes, we're getting asked and those questions are increasing, but so are them from our customers because they're getting the same questions. And the reality is how we're trying to deal, deal with it at the moment is not in a flashy sustainability report, although most of us have got those, it's about proper information to the likes of the CDP, where we're all being measured on an equal platform. Yeah, I think I can echo what you said, Drew. Uh, I think on top of CDP, we as a company, we have a continuous link with uh, key investors. And I think as you mentioned, um, Jens, over the landscape today is very much full of uh, climate change um, uh, commitments. Uh, I personally uh, never seen like before investors asking us questions about our water stewardship journey. So probably it's, 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 it's part, part of the answer is that um, uh, is more a, a, an issue about ESG investors. Uh, today, even mainstream investors, they are very much focusing on non-financial uh, uh, 
KPIs performance, and I think water is one of the very essential uh, elements. Yeah, and I can add, I want to echo the, the aspect of CDP as being a great uh, just reporting tool in terms of how we um, get that information on water to investors. But overall, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how often or how frequent, I would say kind of a step back that um, in general, investors are increasingly interested in ESG issues that are material to the industry and company. Um, and then in case of apparel, uh, water is a material issue and um, given its heavy reliance on, on water as an industry. But I wouldn't say that that uh, investor asks on water specifically are like, there's a, there's a floodgate that's been opened yet. Um, I think there's still more work to do in terms of uh, kind of engaging that investor community on connecting the dots between water risk and um, company risk. Uh, but, it's, but it's coming and it's here and it's a material issue. The other thing I would say around uh, investors is, uh, you know, often they're looking to understand two, two things. Um, how are you mitigating risk? And how are you ensuring that the company has governance structures and incentives in place to mitigate that risk? And I think there's an interesting uh, opportunity with AWS in terms of addressing those two points. So um, for mitigating risk, as Sarah was talking about, it's it offers, again, that holistic approach to water stewardship, not just uh, efficiency reductions within the walls of your uh, operations, but also understanding the context in which your operations sit in terms of that basin uh, and any and any broader kind of basin challenges. The other thing around governance structures and incentives is with that kind of certification stamp, that could be a way to kind of indicate um, to a company um, how how decisions are made around sourcing or or improvement opportunities. Um, these are all conjectures. These aren't actually where we're not we're not implementing these um, within GAP just now. But I think that that kind of looking down the path, there is that opportunity, and then communicating this approach um, to investors could be a powerful signal to demonstrate how both the company and the supplier is. Um, on a journey to, to mitigate that risk and incorporating these governance structures and decision-making incentives. So uh, I think that that it's we're on that path, but um, again, not the floodgate of, of like banging down our door yet on, on water, uh, water issues from investors. Thank you. That is, that is a really good to hear that uh, investors do ask about this and, and that you start to get engaged or you, that you're asked to get engaged with the, to report on these topics, not only via sustainability report, but, but that only also uh, the stock markets are asking via the CDP reporting formats uh, in, of, the, of the business. Uh, before we come to the questions to the um, audience, uh, let me pose one other question and remind the audience that you can still pose questions in the Pathable chat. Um, coming to this uh, public reporting, uh, communication, uh, it's, I know it's from my own company, it's very difficult always to get topics through uh, in communications when it's not a hot topic, when it's not like uh, a scandal on reputational risks. Uh, it can be difficult to get communication and the budget for, for this work internally. Um, how do you support your, your argument within the companies to do further work on these sustainability issues if, if you are allowed to talk about this internally, basically? How do you push that? That's, would give me also an idea how to push it forward in my own company. I can kick off again. Everyone's gone quiet, so uh, <laughs> always good to talk. Uh, I, I think it, it's for all of us in the sustainability space or the water space, trying to get momentum, trying to get your colleagues involved, trying to get a wider forum for this whole thing is vital. Now, everyone and every report will tell you, oh, you do it from top down, et cetera, et cetera. But if we're all honest with each other, 
You know, it's the day-to-day -day business drivers that everyone listens to first. And for us, our day-to-day -day business is providing a service to our growers, and that includes the third-party growers as well. But more importantly, meeting the requirements of our customers. And that's one of the reasons why we were attracted to AWS, because we didn't see our customers moving fast enough in this direction. So we have tried to push it in a slightly different way to normal. But if our customer says jump, invariably the business jumps. And I think that's a big factor with, within all of this. So yeah, I would say it's not easy. It's again, one of those complications, but, and, and, and yeah, getting a tick in a box and I've got a standard, we have to remember this is an ongoing journey. And so it needs to be continual investment. We have to show a value. And I mentioned this earlier on. And an audit doesn't often show you a value. It's just another tick from an industry situation. But what we're trying to do here is show the grower. If you do it in this way, you can actually save a bit more money. If you do the job properly, you can get customers who want to be doing this as well. And so you have to show a value proposition for everything we do. But in reality, yeah, it's, you have to look at your day-to-day -day drivers to actually make that difference. Uh, yeah. If you want to, oh, please, ladies first, if you wanted to start. Uh, sure, I'll just, because uh, I'll build on um, what Drew was saying in terms of, uh, you know, that value driver, uh, it comes in, in, to play in the evolution of our water stewardship journey, uh, really kind of raising the flag through a risk approach and saying this is important to manage. But I think critically, it's about now evolving that conversation to saying, well, here are the opportunities, the value drivers that uh, water stewardship can play and what are the solutions. Um, AWS uh, and water stewardship offer solutions uh, to a problem that can in turn drive value for suppliers, for customers. Um, ultimately, uh, looking at, you know, and another way to think about it too is looking at water in this increasingly constrained system that we'll be operating in um, as a catalyst for creativity, as a catalyst for saying, well, we're all facing this shared challenge. How do we innovate and partner and uh, solve our way out of this, uh, out of this problem and, and really kind of painting a different narrative from that, like, yes, we know risk and doom and gloom and it's coming, but how, what are the opportunities and, um, and kind of, I'll say it again, and just echoing Drew, but what is the value uh, creation that can happen through this approach? Yeah, listen, um, if the question is, uh, or if I understood well, yes, what are the drivers uh, to move uh, the sustainability agenda forward and how to invest in the resources? Uh, on my side, just a couple of points. Uh, first of all, I think that overall, not only for water, um, sustainability uh, within a company uh, is no more considered nice to have, but it's a core to the business. So this has changed a lot, the landscape for those who are working in this area, because probably 10 years ago, you would spend 90% of your time to um, try to convince people doing something. Today, I think the problem is not to convince people doing something, but it's what to do, to what is good enough. So this would be the point. And I think it's very, very, very good progress in these terms. Uh, second, when it's about water, uh, I think I mentioned before, I can be uh, more clear, uh, uh, because it is a cross-cutting element in our value chain, no water, no Nestle, put it this way. Uh, therefore, I think in the past, uh, we have been historically, since the company has been created more than 150 years ago, we have always invested quite a lot of money in managing water resources. I think the point now going into water stewardship uh, dimension is how to more smartly invest limited resources. And I think when you invest uh, money into projects, uh, uh, delivering value at the catchment level and not only into your factory, you do not only have the highest chance to uh, address and solve the issue. And as I said before, not only decrease your water dependency, but also you have much bigger communication opportunities and engagement opportunities with stakeholders. So for me, this is the reason why 
uh, we have really the, 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 the elements to move the water stewardship strategy forward within our company. Great, thank you very much. Um, before we, we close off uh, with Sarah, um, what advice would you give to other companies how to get involved in the water stewardship journey? We've learned a lot about benefits and, and also about difficulties in the past, but uh, what advice uh, would you have for the other? Uh, and what, 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 what would you have liked to know before you started your personal water stewardship journey? If you want, I can start, it can be quick. Uh, me, if there is one just message or one key takeaway, now that you have the standard, take the standard and use it because we didn't have this chance before. Great, thank you. Because I mean, I can add on this. If you use the standard and while you use the standard, you will understand the issues better. You will gather the data and the information you need and you will get connected with the key stakeholders with whom you will look for the solutions. This is locally. Uh, especially, yeah. So wherever you are, that's the beauty. I'll build on that and say, uh, you know, in a, in addition, with that context of uh, the standard, use the standard. It's really just about rolling up your sleeves, getting started, and and diving in in that local context, because then you start to understand. And using the standard, AWS standard, it, through that process um, can help walk you through that. But just to understand how dynamics um, are taking place at a local level, uh, I think there can be some uh, a lot of thought and planning that can go into you know, high level corporate enterprise wide goals, but really just what it, if you're on the beginning stages of your journey, just roll it to roll your sleeves up and get started. Just to Thank build you. on all of that, of course, I'd agree with both Carlo and Lisa. Uh, it's a great framework. And not only that, there's some great materials for training. Uh, and it's actually not that difficult when you start doing the training, how it all fits in, because very often it already fits in with the practices and the GFS standards that you'll already have on your operations. So it isn't scary. It's just a case of getting into it and starting to collaborate with people. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all stewards of the environment um, now and in the future. So we just need to get hold of it. You don't have to go for the audit straight away and the tick in the box. Work towards it. Take what you're doing already and then just see where it needs to be added. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think these were very great last words, motivating also other participants, uh, interested parts uh, to go for the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard and just start moving into this. Uh, Lisa, Carlo, and Drew, I thank you very much for participating in this uh, discussion, uh, which I would love to have to continue this uh, another for another half an hour, but you know that time is limited at Stockholm Water Week. And with this, I would like to hand over to Sarah for a brief wrap up and closing of the session. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Jens. I don't quite know how I'm going to follow all four of you. Um, I am thrilled to hear the way you've all spoken today. Um, about your water stewardship journey, about your perspectives, and, and of course, also it's always nice to hear good things about AWS. Um, but I think what I'm really gonna take away from today is of course, um, to just get started. And I think that's what, something that we hear quite regularly in our webinars is, is don't be scared, um, don't be intimidated because the standard can seem like a huge undertaking when you first look at it or when you first try and convince a supplier to look at it. Um, but once you get started, things can feel a little, a little bit easier. And I think the theme that's come through all of the conversation I've heard is, is working within the local context with your communities in partnership. Um, and that stakeholder engagement piece just being so important to really help overcome those, those challenges and, and to break it down into something that feels more meaningful. I guess the thing I would add um, from our experience is that many people start the AWS journey or the water stewardship journey expecting to go down one path. 
and they find themselves taking a completely different path and, and doing something at a site or a business level that they didn't expect at all. But it's because they found a subject and a topic that really resonates within the business, that works for your communications colleagues, that works with your suppliers, that works with all the different aspects of the business. And that's really where you can um, start to make real progress quite quickly with those that internal buy-in that we all know you need. Um, we will be doing a write-up of this session and the session that we held earlier in the week. Um, so I look forward to hopefully continuing the conversation with many of you. Uh, if you have more questions about AWS, um, or you want to carry on having this discussion with some of us, um, you can contact us um, via my email, which is on the screen there, uh, as well as our general email address. Um, I'd encourage you as well, if you're interested to know more about the standard or other sort of knowledge products and resources to help you with water stewardship to visit our website. There's lots of case studies, tools and other resources on there to help as well. But all I will say now is a huge, huge thank you to our panel. I wish I could just take everything you've said and just use it every time I'm speaking to a new person about AWS. Couldn't have said it better myself, but it sounds so much stronger coming from all of you. So thank you a, a huge amount from all of us. And hopefully we'll get to see each other very soon in person. Take care, everyone, and thanks to our audience for joining the session. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Cheers, bye.